Alrighty, well, let's um, continue on our study of the Holy Spirit. Uh, let me just begin by a very brief review of what we've uh, been looking at so far. Uh, we're, we're trying to uh, understand who the Spirit is, uh, and we understand, of course, He's the third person of the triune God, and we, we tried to understand what His particular nature is, and although technically all the persons of the Godhead have the same nature, He seems to have something that um, sort of causes Him to stand out, and that one thing we saw was love. Certainly, God is love, but again, the way this thinking goes, the Spirit of God is, in a particular way, that love. And so the work that He does in us is all revolves around this, this love that He produces. Now again, um, just looking at the different works that He does, for instance, uh, in regeneration, the thing that He does in, in us, in our souls, to make us trust Jesus Christ is that he gives us a love for Jesus Christ. We wouldn't love him otherwise. As a matter of fact, we can only know that we're born again if we truly love God and are trusting in him. In sanctification, the Spirit of God uh, continues to work his nature in us, and so he causes us to grow in love, again, making us more like our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we saw that with regard to the calling with which he calls us in life, uh, what he does is he gives us a love for a particular work, uh, either to help our neighbor or to serve God in some way, or actually those are both the same thing. But he gives us a desire to go a particular way or a love for a particular work. In guiding us, we might say that he draws our love in a particular direction, uh, not only in, let's say, the large thing that we're going to do with our lives, which... Um, you know, is, um, let's say, a particular direction he wants us to go, but even in the smaller things, one of the ways he guides us is by drawing our hearts out in that direction. Uh, we saw the Spirit of God equips us with gifts, uh, gifts by which we might love God by serving him with those gifts, and gifts also to serve the brethren in order to love them as well, and, and that has to do, of course, with fellowship. And actually, I'm not sure if we tie this into it, but um, the, the kinds of gifts that God gives to us also helps to sort of narrow down the direction he would have us to go. So gifting is also a way that God reveals to us his will or guides us by his Holy Spirit. And then we see that, that God actually empowers us by his Spirit by strengthening that love. I mean, what was it that gave the early disciples boldness to preach the word of God after they had prayed and, and been filled with the Spirit of God, except God gave them a greater love for him and a greater love and desire for the work. Uh, the stronger your heart is toward the Lord, the more you're going to do what the Lord calls you to do. And likewise, the weaker it is, then uh, the less we're going to do, which is why the, the point in every one of these, or I should say the application in every one of these lessons thus far, has been to make sure that we do all that we can to encourage the Spirit's work in our hearts, to increase the love that is in our hearts, to get more of the Holy Spirit by not quenching the Spirit of God, by not grieving the Spirit of God, but rather by agreeing with Him, walking by the Spirit so that we don't carry out the desire of the flesh, and by not being drunk or... Um, I suppose you know, we certainly can enlarge that principle more, not being intoxicated with things that are contrary to God, but rather being filled with the Spirit of God, which means being under His control. The only way that you and I are going to be able to glorify God is if we are filled with His Holy Spirit. So we need a strong love. Now, uh, what we want to look at this evening is perhaps... Um, descending a little bit further into the uh, teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, we've already looked at the fact that the Spirit of God guides us through our calling, giving us a desire uh, to do a particular thing with our lives. Uh, uh, he guides us through his gifting for a particular work. Uh, it sort of eliminates uh, certain things and opens the doors to certain other things if we understand what our gifts are. We know the Spirit of God also is working out um, uh, the, the sovereign plan of God, so he's opening doors and he's closing doors according to his will. 
And, of course, we know that the most um, specific way that God guides us is through his word. So this evening, what I want us to do is, is to consider that a little bit more carefully and actually, um, especially in light of um, the way things are going today. I think you understand that right now the um, Supreme Court is considering whether or not the Defense of Marriage Act is constitutional or not, and things continue to go in a way that's um, increasingly wicked. Uh, in a situation like that where things are turning more and more against the church, we need to have a very strong conviction that what we are staking our lives on and what we are willing to stand on and what we're willing to suffer for actually is true. But that's, again, the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the work that he does in uh, illumination, and that's what we want to uh, consider uh, briefly the, this evening. Uh, let me just ask the question, does anybody know what illumination is? We're talking about that particular work of the Holy Spirit. What is illumination? Okay. Uh, helping us to understand something. Uh, and the word itself, you know, we, we think of, I mean, illumination has a particular meaning. It means to shine light or it means to brighten or in this case, to sort of turn on the lights uh, so that we can see something uh, in the Word of God. So the Spirit, in illumination, shines on the Word of God, helps us understand the Word of God, and guards us from error. Now, that's one of a few things that actually he brings about uh, through this work. But let's, let's begin by focusing on this fact that he helps us understand the word and he guards us from error. Let's let's turn up in our Bibles 1 John chapter 2. And perhaps I could uh, ask uh, for a volunteer to read that if you can read it loudly enough for it to be picked up by the uh, the microphones. Let's see. It's 1 John chapter 2 and if you could read uh, verses 18 through 29. Who would like to volunteer to do that? Pam? The living is in the last hour, and just as we heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out, so that it would be shown that they were not of us. But we have an anointing. Okay. Now, let's, let's ask a couple of questions about this uh, passage, if, if everybody is looking at it. Um, uh, John is addressing a particular situation in which there are many false teachers that, that have arisen. But he did say that these, his, his audience, these believers, had something that protected them uh, from these, uh, these teachers or these false teachings that were, that were going out, and, and what is it that was protecting them? What is it that they had? The anointing. Yeah, the anointing. What anointing? 
Okay, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, the question is, what is this anointing, and what does it do, what doesn't it do? And let, let's, um, let's ask this question, first of all. Uh, we are talking about illumination. And uh, sometimes this, this passage is read, and um, it, it's interpreted in such a way that um, uh, it, it tells us that basically the Spirit of God is, is going to teach us directly. The Spirit of God is going to um, perhaps eliminate the need for teachers, and we're going to come back that uh, to come back to that in just a moment. But if the Spirit of God actually did teach us directly and eliminated the need for any teachers, uh, what would He in fact be doing for us here? I mean, what what um, what will we call that work if He were in fact doing that kind of work? If He were communicating to us directly, giving us information? Okay, revelation, that's right, revelation, or another word is inspiration, but both mean the same thing. God would be revealing things to us directly. Now, do we believe that that's how the Lord deals with us? Do we believe that, that he reveals truth directly to us like that? Okay, there, there are branches of the church that do believe that God may do that for particular individuals, maybe prophets or people who speak in tongues, but we don't believe that he is doing that today, but rather he has given all the truth that he is going to give us already in the word of God. The, the, the Bible is complete, okay? And we're not going to spend time trying to demonstrate that, but just wanted to point out the difference. So what he's doing is he is talking about illumination. Now, what, what is it that the spirit of God is, is actually doing then at this, in this passage? If he's not communicating truth, what is he actually doing? Time. The Spirit is applying it to our lives. He's not only giving us direction and helping us make an effort to make the type of decision. Okay. Now, in this text, what is the specific thing that he's applying? Again, you know how people tend to, um, to read passages of scripture absolutely abstract from, from its context. There's actually a context here that, that limits what the Spirit of God is, is doing. He's not just communicating everything and teaching you everything, but he's doing something in particular. What, what is it, Donna? Right, now what is wrong is being taught by these antichrists, by these false teachers. What is right is being taught by whom? Well, the spirit ultimately, but, um, but there is, who is the one that's actually communicating the truth that the spirit of God is going to show them that is right? Okay, who is the one that's communicating the truth to them? as over against the error of the false teachers that the Spirit of God is actually going to confirm. Okay. All right, and then if we move along those lines up to verse 26, look at what he says. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. And as for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true and not a lie, and just as it is taught you, you abide in him. Now, I think what John is saying here is not that I'm telling, this, this is what I'm telling you. I'm trying to show you that these guys are false teachers, but you don't need me to tell you that because you already know that. Now, that's true at one level, but you also know that what I'm telling you is true because the Spirit of God is bearing witness with that, okay? So in other words, what Ty said earlier is true, that the Spirit of God is giving to you a certain application of truth that it's already been delivered to you. So instead of, what I'm saying is, instead of communicating to you information, he's simply confirming the information that's already been given, okay? Concerning what you've heard and concerning what John says here, I'm teaching you regarding those trying to deceive you. The Spirit of God will confirm the truth, and he will confirm also that error is error, 
In other words, he will show us. We don't need anybody to teach us that the truth is the truth. The Spirit of God will bear witness to the truth. Does that make sense? Okay. So that, that is the work of illumination, and that's different than inspiration because it's not communicating information to us, but rather giving us a conviction that this truth is true. Okay? All right. Now, again, this is the work of the Holy Spirit to, to shine, as it were, on the pages of Scripture to help us gain a couple of things. Now, one of them is this conviction, and we're going to want to come back to that in a minute. But I really did want to start with uh, the idea of his helping us understand. I think that's also a part of this whole um, picture. Now, <clears throat> one thing I think that Jonathan Edwards pointed out that, um, that is true, um, I think would be helpful here. And that is how the Spirit of God works when a believer reads the Bible in illumination that would not be true if you were reading, let's say, uh, some other book that was written merely by men. Let's say, uh, you know, all of us, I'm sure, read different things. We read newspapers, magazines. Uh, maybe we read labels on, you know, ingredient labels on, <laughs> on different uh, packaged food. Uh, we read novels, perhaps, uh, classics, whatever, and we read the Bible. Now, what does the Spirit of God do differently when we read the Bible versus when we read something else? What is it that he does that's different? Or does he do anything different? When we read the Bible, is it just a matter of just figuring out what the words mean like it is with anything else? Okay, he, he does confirm it as a truth. Uh, Edwards, of course, had a way of, uh, of sort of delving deeper into that issue as to how he does that, what it is that uh, he actually does. And it's also tied into uh, his particular nature, which is love. I'm sorry, not love of, of just anything, but love of something in particular. And did you, were you going to say something? Yeah. So he's helping us, helping us better understand the Word of God so that we might better apply it to our lives. And that, that's certainly true, and that is a part of guidance. And as, as we said before, under guidance, this is the main way that the Spirit of God actually leads us, you know, not just providentially by opening and closing doors or by giving us desires to do certain things or certain gifts that lend themselves to particular kinds of work, but the main way he does it is through the Word of God. Now... Again, what is the different thing that he does when we read the Bible versus reading a cookbook or a textbook? Okay, well, we, we certainly do, and the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God gives to us a greater influence, you know, of, of his influence by reading this. If we pick up a cookbook, we have no guarantee the Spirit of God is going to work at all, right? Unless, of course, we're contemplating, you know, making something that isn't good for us, perhaps he'll show us and get us not to do it. <laughs> or maybe he won't. But uh, the thing is, with, with the Bible, the Spirit of God does something differently, and it, make, it, it makes a big difference in how we perceive it. Yeah, he gives us a love for it. So okay. All right. He gives us a love for the words, and there's something in particular that... Oh, I'm sorry, Maria. That's right, certainly do. And that is, again, the Spirit of God helping us and guiding us through the words. Um, and we, don't, we don't necessarily just sort of go like, like this and say that applies to my situation, but by reading and understanding the Bible, we know what God would have us to do in particular situations. And again, 
That is a way that he guides us. But then again, now what is it, coming back to this other point, what is it that the Spirit of God does? Well, he gives us a love for the Bible because, of course, it's his word, right? Uh, the uh, prophets moved by the Spirit spoke from God. They, they wrote from God and so forth. The word of God is inspired. It's God-breathed and so forth. And again, the agent of that inspiration is the Holy Spirit. But what it is that he does to draw our hearts out to the word of God is that he reveals to us in the word of God what it, what it actually is. In other words, that it is his word and that it is, well, let me ask you this question. If, if you were to compare the Bible to any other book, what is it that you would use to describe the character of this book as over against other books? It's usually on the cover of just about every Bible, holy, it's holy, right? It's holy because this is God's word, whereas you know, the cookbook is not his word or the novel is not his word. So there's something that's different about this book, and that difference is it is a divine book. You know, it's been given directly by God, or in a certain sense it is, because the words are actually the very words that he would have penned. This is exactly what he wants to communicate to us. The Word of God, again, because it's the Word of God, has no errors in it, can't fail to be true, and so forth, and all of it is the Word of God. It is a divine book given by God. It has a holiness about it. And it's that holiness that the Spirit of God opens our eyes to see and draws our hearts out to the fact that this is the book of the one that we love most of all. Okay. Now, that, as our hearts are drawn out to it, it's going to make a difference between the way we read this book and the way we read other books. I mean, what, how do you read the Bible differently because it's a divine book? You pay much more attention to it, don't you? Okay, you, you, you focus on it. I mean, uh, if, if your heart is drawn out to something, if you really, really desire to, to, to read it, it, it does concentrate your mind on it. And uh, the fact that it happens to be God's word is not only going to uh, make you focus on it more, but what, what else is it going to do? Ty? We certainly will cherish it, that is true. And um, knowing that it comes from God and that um, the Lord takes it seriously um, will also cause a certain kind of um, tone to our reading. Um, certainly we'll cherish it because it is the word of the God whom we love, but uh, there is also that fear of the Lord. You know, God's going to take this seriously, we better take it seriously. If you know your life, and even more than your life, your eternal soul depends on this, it will give you a certain amount of clarity and focus, and you'll pay much closer attention to it. Donna? That's right. I would say that um, it's, it's undoubtedly true that when you're reading slowly and meditating that you're going to experience much more of this than you would if you're just trying to get your four chapters in. It is possible to read the Word of God and not to see it differently. I mean, have there ever been times when you picked up the Bible and read it and it didn't seem really that much different? You knew it was the Word of God, but 
somehow it just seemed like any other book as far as you know, just words and sentences and so forth, different ideas and propositions and so forth. Um, but there are those times, and I, and I believe we need to pray and ask for this, the Spirit of God would help us to, to focus on it, even when we're doing our Bible reading program. Uh, if we have to read it quickly for some reason or another, just to kind of keep up, uh, to pray that the Spirit of God would work in such a way to draw our attention to it. But again, recognize that um, realizing all these things are true, that this is God's Word, we're going to treat it differently than if we pick up a novel. Okay, I'm not talking about just that. Uh, you, if you pick up a novel and you're reading page after page, you really don't care whether you understood that per, you know, exactly or, or not. Uh, it's not that important, but when your internal soul uh, rests on this truth, uh, then it's going to focus you more. But again, the Spirit of God will do that. He will give you that greater focus. He will also give you that, uh, that love we were talking about that focuses your mind and so forth. So... The Spirit of God in his illumination helps us to see the Bible for what it is. It is divine. It is holy. It is God's words. And he'll also help us to sense what is actually writing on this truth, which will give us, again, greater clarity and, and focus. So we will take this much more seriously than we'll take any other piece of literature. Now, the Spirit of God not only shows us that that beauty of that holiness, that divinity of the word, which uh, may even sometimes even appear to us uh, in, in, as, as light. I mean, not, you know, in, in a sense sort of like, an, um, how would I say, in an experiential way, not, not a literal way, but you'll find yourself being enlightened as you, as you read it. But the Spirit of God also gives you a conviction that these things are true. Now, we've, we've talked about that a little bit, but let's focus on that a little bit more. Uh, one passage of scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. If uh, someone could look that up and maybe volunteer to read it, so, okay, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, and then if somebody could, could look up Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Okay, uh, Dick, did you get that? Okay, um, first of all, 1 Corinthians 12.3. Okay. Now let's let's consider what what that particular passage means. And uh, actually, why don't we compare it? We'll, we'll go ahead and um, and read the Romans ten nine and ten passage as well because it contains something quite similar to it. Okay. Now, the question is, um, again, let me, uh, let, me just, let me just pull up the Romans 10 passage because I didn't put it in my notes. Okay. Now, the question, let me ask you this question. If you say Jesus is Lord, does that automatically come from the Holy Spirit? And if you in uh, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, does that automatically save you? Okay, what, what exactly is Paul saying, especially in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, that the Spirit of God is actually doing in, in this when we say Jesus is Lord? Okay, is it, is it just simply uttering the words? I mean, have you ever read Romans uh, 10, 9, and 10 and wondered... Uh, if, if uh, you confess, if somebody just simply says, Jesus is Lord, does that automatically mean they're saved? No. Okay, no. What, what more needs to be there? What is it that the Spirit of God is actually doing here? No one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. If I handed somebody a piece of paper who wasn't a Christian that said, Jesus is Lord on there, and I said, read that, and, he, and he'd say, Jesus is Lord. Okay, did he just say that by the Holy Spirit? 
Well, nobody can say Jesus is the Lord except by the Holy Spirit, so it must be the Holy Spirit's work, right? No, because that's not what it means. So what, what does it mean? No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Donna? Okay. And what does that what does that mean then as far as as far as how you perceive that statement, Jesus is Lord? So it contains several things, doesn't it? The Spirit of God actually brings about. It means that when I say it, it's true, Jesus is my Lord. But it also means that this is something that I know to be true. Jesus isn't just a fiction. He's real, and he is Lord, and he is my Lord. That's something that this, only the Spirit of God can actually bring about. It's not just uttering the words, but it's the meaning, as it were, behind it. Again, in Romans 10, 9, and 10, you know, it has to be more than just with your mouth. It has to be a belief that is in your heart that, he is, that this is in fact true, that God has in fact raised him from the dead. So the point here is simply this, that the Spirit of God not only helps us understand the Word of God, but he also gives us a conviction that it's true. Because how do you know that Jesus is Lord? How do you even know who Jesus is? Well, you read about him in, in the Bible, right? And you learn about who he is and so forth. And this, this is the content the Spirit of God has to help me understand it, but the Spirit of God will also help me to believe it with this kind of conviction, the strength of conviction, okay? Now, we might ask the question how he, he does that, and I think, again, the mechanism is, is, uh, is love, okay? But we want to add one other dimension right here, and that is the fact that the Spirit of God helps us to see the truth as truth. I mean, is there anything going on in the world, anything going on in your heart, or anything going on anywhere that would lead you to believe that these things that are written in the Bible aren't true? Hearts. Can you think of anything anywhere that would be working against you with regard to the belief that this is the Bible? What's that? That are working against you. Okay, and, and how do they work against us? Okay. Can you think of any particulars as far as how that works? I mean, how does the world work against you to try to make you believe the Bible isn't true? And how does the devil work against you? He basically works through the world, doesn't he? But what is his main, his main tool that he uses? Lies. He uses lies. He uses deception. <laughs> okay, so he tries to distract us by tempting us to sin. He lies to us. Uh, the world, I mean, if you look at the world around you, does it look to you as though they are living in the light of God's truth, or does it look to you like they've just pushed it out of the way? I mean, when, with the question of is it, is it right for homosexuals to marry, okay, is the Supreme Court considering what the Bible says regarding that? No, they, they, they push that out because our government believes there should be the separation between the church and state. They don't have to listen to the Bible. They can just kind of do whatever they want to do. And so even the people who are, who are uh, uh, presenting arguments as to why homosexual marriage uh, shouldn't take place are basing it purely on tradition and not upon the word of God. So th the world lives as though God doesn't exist in many different ways. And so we live in a world that is just dismissing all this truth. And as we, as we uh, as see those people, it, it has an effect on us too, doesn't it? We see all these people doing a particular thing. We often base our arguments of why we do particular things because everybody's doing it, you know. Well, everybody is living as though God doesn't exist and though the Bible isn't his word. So, you know, it, there's a temptation for us to do it too so that we might fit in, right? So the world is working to 
cover up the knowledge of God. Satan is lying to us uh, about this. and He's introduced many lies like evolution and so forth. And we have an internal enemy that's also trying to uh, destroy or tear down the knowledge of God. It's a sin inside of our hearts. So all these things are, are working against us. So why do we need the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit to show us the truth of the word of God is because of all these enemies that are constantly working against us. We have to be able to see it, and that is the Spirit's work. Regardless of what the world thinks, the Bible is true. Regardless of the, the fact the world thinks that you know, if they die, they're all going to go to heaven, there's no final judgment and so forth, it isn't true. What the Bible says is true, that whoever doesn't trust in Jesus Christ is going to perish, and we're all going to stand before the judgment seat. And what God says is the right thing to do is the right thing to do. And what he says is sin is sin. And when he says he's going to judge us for sin, that is true as well. Now, again, if we are going to devote ourselves to live according to the way that God would have us to live, we have to be convinced that these things are true. Again, it's you know, slowly by degrees getting to the point, it seems, where it's going to become, well, or already is uncomfortable, but dangerous to, to be a Christian, right? So if you're going to, um, let's say, stake your life, I mean, if I'm going to devote my life to living the life that Christ calls me to live, to following him, and if following him means that I'm going to have to suffer persecution, uh, whether it be, you know, I, I, I'm going to be blacklisted from this particular kind of job or I'm going to be put down, put to shame, or I'm going to be, you know, beaten or I'm going to be killed. I mean, I have to be convinced that what I am staking all this on is really true, right? I mean, I have to, ha I have, to have a conviction. I have to have a, a strong conviction. I have to be able to see that it's true. But that's exactly what the Spirit of God does. Now, again, books have been written about why we believe the Bible is the word of God, why we believe, you know, uh, God exists. You know, there's books on natural revelation, apologetics. There's books written on the Bible that bring out many different things about its perfections and things that, that show that it is the word of God. I mean, some of the things we've looked at before, you've got 66 books written over a 1,500-year period by 40-plus different authors that all agree on highly controversial things. I mean, that's, that's extremely unusual, uh, actually unheard of <laughs> in human terms. Uh, there's never been anything that's recorded in the Bible archeologically that's ever been proven false. And there's been even archeologists who have put out a cash prize for anybody that could demonstrate anything the Bible says to be false. And they've never been able to collect on that because what the Bible says is true as over against, let's say the Book of Mormon where Nothing can be found in the book in archaeology, no trace of it because it's just fiction. The Bible is not fiction. Plus, there's fulfilled prophecy, which is you know, in incredible, impossible, couldn't happen, except that the one who authored it knew what was going to happen because he knew what he was intending on doing. So all of these things are different ways by which we know that the Bible is the word of God. We would expect that of the Bible. But the way that we are absolutely convinced that these things are true, enough to stake our lives on it, doesn't come really from those kinds of arguments. It comes from the work of the Spirit of God in our hearts, giving us that absolute conviction. Let me uh, just read a section from the Westminster Confession that... Um, where they bring out that particular point. It says, we may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture and the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give gl all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the many other incomparable excellencies and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the word of God. Yet, notwithstanding, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. 
the Spirit of God gives us that conviction. It goes beyond even the evidence. But we would expect this evidence to be here, of course, that this is God's Word. But the Spirit of God is the one who actually gives us strong enough belief and conviction actually to, um, well, to found our lives on it, to risk our lives, as it were, to, you know, to give our all for the Lord, for what the Word of God actually says. So this illuminating work of the Holy Spirit helps us to understand what the Bible says by showing us the, the glory of God or that divinity of the Word, giving us a love for the Bible. He also gives us this conviction that these things are absolutely true so that we're willing to stake our lives on this, I mean, willing to go to death, as it were. You know, not, not like the, uh, some of the early Christians that there was a time in church history where they were required in order not to be killed, to give up copies of the scripture and to be willing to offer a pinch of incense and say Caesar is Lord. That happened around the time, I believe, of, of Augustine and there was this big controversy after the change of authority in, in Roman uh, government where they no longer had to do that. And then these Christians who had denied the Lord wanted to come back into the church whether or not they could. Augustine believed they could if they truly repented and there were others who believed that they couldn't. But the point is, the Spirit of God, if in His work, can, and He certainly will, if we're not quenching the Spirit, but we're being filled with the Spirit, we will have a conviction, He will give us a conviction strong enough to give up our lives, to become martyrs for the Lord, if that's what He calls us to do. So again, He helps us understand, He gives us conviction that these things are true. Uh, finally, and I'm going to have to go through this quickly because we are out of time, he certainly gives us the ability to apply the Word of God. Again, if He focuses our mind on it and gives us a love for it, you know, whatever your heart desires, that's the direction you go. And if you desire the Word of God, He will help you understand it and He will help you uh, apply it. I just wanted to say a couple of quick things here, too, just to round this off. I told you I was going to come back to this point. We looked at 1 John chapter 2 and the fact that um, John wasn't actually saying we don't need teachers. But he was saying you don't need anyone to teach you that what I'm saying is true. That what they're saying is wrong and what I'm saying is true because the Spirit of God bears witness with what John was saying because he was speaking, of course, by the Spirit of God. But just a couple of other reasons why we do need teachers and why this doesn't just eliminate the need for teaching as though the illumination of the Spirit of God is, is enough, is because God gives us teachers and He gives certain individuals to teach. And because He does, God is telling us we need teachers. Okay, well, that's, that's one reason. But the reason why He does that is because, again, in illumination, the Spirit isn't communicating truth, but He's confirming truth. And so, the idea that uh, we, we, you know, that we, we don't need teachers, that we don't need anybody to communicate truth to us, the Spirit of God is simply going to uh, illumine and not communicate truth. I guess, well, actually, let me think about that. I think the main reason would be this, is because um, the Spirit of God, according to the level at which He works in our lives, and that would depend on, on how much we have of the Spirit of God, is only, is only going to show us so much. There, there is that um, command in Scripture that we do need to study. Study to show ourselves approved. Study to know the Word of God, to rightly divide the Word, which means not separating the Old Testament from the New Testament, which applies to Jews and Gentiles, but rather it means how to correctly understand the Word of God. Some of that comes through study. And... There are those that, that are given by God to devote themselves to studying the Word of God who have this illuminating work of the Holy Spirit whom the Father, or actually uh, uh, the Lord, uh, we might say the, the triune God, gives to His church in order to speed up that process for those who don't have as much time to devote to doing this. So even though we might all be the recipients of illumination and we can all read the Bible and the Spirit of God can focus our minds on it, and help us to see the divinity of it and so forth. There are still certain mechanisms that need to be in place that, that we need to use in order to understand uh, the Bible 
just thinking of an analogy, I mean, the fact that, um, let, let's say that um, you, you don't understand English, and yet you have an English Bible. When you read the Bible and the Spirit of God is illuminating, illuminating these words, does that mean that you're going to be able to understand them? No. It still has, there's other things that come into play. You have to understand the language, right? And you have to be able to, to study it, to know it, to know the relationships and these intricacies and so forth. So you do need a teacher to study it and to uh, uh, express it to you, but I believe that the Spirit of God will work along with that teacher to convince you that what you're hearing is, in fact, what he's saying. I hope that makes, uh, hope that makes sense. So anyway, the Lord gives us teachers because we need teachers. Illumination by itself isn't enough. We don't all have time to study the Bible to the degree that perhaps we would like to, but the Lord has given certain individuals to the church who can and who do and who share that to help speed you along in your understanding, and as he does, the Spirit of God will bear witness with what you're hearing to either show you that this is, in fact, what the Bible says or it isn't, which is why, of course, we always need to be comparing the scriptures with what we're hearing. Okay. Uh, sorry, I've been going a little bit over time, but I wanted to get this other point out as well. And, and this last question. If the Spirit of God illumines all believers, if we all have this, I may have already answered this question, but shouldn't we all then believe the same thing? Shouldn't we all believe, uh, you know, that what, you know, as far as what the Bible teaches on every subject, shouldn't we all see it the same way if the Spirit of God is illumining us? Yes. I think yes, but I'm sure. Okay. So, yes, but we do have sin, and so we don't all see it the way we ought to see it. Now, Peter actually said of Paul's writings in 2 Peter 3.16 that there were some things that Paul wrote that were difficult, difficult to understand which means that illumination doesn't eliminate the fact that it's sometimes difficult to understand what the Bible teaches. Uh, I think we all understand that as we've read through it and have tried to wrestle over particular issues and so forth. Um, the Bible perhaps, well, it's as clear as it needs to be, and the problem is certainly with, with our minds. But uh, one thing we do need to be thankful for is that what we need to believe regarding salvation is clear enough, is so clear, that a person with average intelligence can read the Bible and understand it and be saved. But that doesn't mean that everything in the Bible is clear. Um, who thinks that eschatology or the study of last things is clear, you know? There's a lot in the Bible about that, and there's a lot of different opinions on what the Bible actually teaches, and all the people that are studying the Bible, we're assuming, have the Spirit of God and yet can come to different conclusions so there are different things that can get in our way, even though we have the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. One of the problems is you get a person who's convicted that the Bible teaches this, and they teach, you know, they're, they're a teacher in the church, and they, they teach everyone that this is what the Bible says, and they get everyone to see it that particular way. And that can happen, you know, even if the Spirit of God is at work. It may not set entirely well with us if we're hearing things that aren't, necessarily true. I remember being in a dispensational church and, you know, looking at the scriptures and, you know, trying to put it all together, trying to keep it all together and having it fall apart in my hands time after time, just not being able to, to quite, uh, you know, see it in the scriptures. And it was because this wasn't what the Bible taught, okay? And that's, um, that's something that I think the Spirit of God will lead you to. But again, teachers teaching certain things, uh, being young in the faith and not really knowing the Bible very well, not having the uh, content the Spirit of God would use to lead you to the truth. But I do believe through careful study of the Scriptures and through prayer that the Spirit of God will lead you to the truth if you are seeking the truth. He will lead us all to the truth, and I think He will lead us all to the same truth and not to different truths for different, um, different denominations, as it were. So... Anyway, that, that's, uh, that's the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. Very important work of the Spirit comes mainly by giving to us a clear view that what we're studying is, in fact, God's Word and giving us a love for it. Once He's done that, it sets us to going, to studying, gives us conviction that's true, we apply it and so forth, and 
through this process transforms us into the image of Christ. Yes. That's right. Well, I guess um, the, the way we would differentiate that is um, we, we would have to make sure that that particular truth is integral to salvation according to the, to the Bible. Um, uh, I mean, how do we differentiate? We, we just have to understand from Scripture that the Lord says this has to be true of you if you're a believer. Um, it, it doesn't have to be true of you to be a believer to believe post-mill, all-mill, or pre-mill. You know, it's not really going to affect whether or not you are saved, but whether or not you live a godly life or an ungodly life has a lot to do with it. You know, you, you can't practice sin and be an unbeliever. You can't deny Christ is the Messiah. You can't deny that he is God. You can't deny the Trinity. You can't deny salvation by grace through faith. So you, you look at what the scripture says about those things that, you know, you can't be saved without, and those are become the foundational or fundamental things. And I do believe the Spirit of God will lead every one of his children to those truths and will do that up front. And the others will not be, of course, that aren't as important. I would, I would imagine, I think we'd all agree, will not be on the top of his list either of ones to convince you or to lead you to. He's going to lead you to the ones that are most important first. And again, hopefully the one who comes to you with the gospel is going to bring you those truths and uh, teach them to you accurately so that you can be saved. But there are people today who aren't. I mean, the ones that say, for instance, that um, just pray this prayer and you're a Christian. Just pray this prayer and you're saved and it doesn't matter how you live after that, you're still going to heaven. You can go and become an enemy of the church and just try to destroy the church and you're still going to heaven. Now that is an error that will condemn a person because that, that is absolutely not true. If we practice sin, we are not born of God. And you have to be born of God if you're going to arrive in heaven. So, yeah, we just have to see what the Bible says about those things. Are there any other questions or comments on this? You mean doubts about whether you, it's true or doubts about what, what it means? Well, all of us go through that all the time. Uh, what, what you have to do is um, you, you pray and he asks the Lord to show you. You look at uh, parallel scriptures that may also talk about it, parallel passages. A good commentary would, would be helpful. Sometimes study Bibles can be good that have notes you know, in them if, if the person who did the notes is a good teacher. <laughs> um, uh, Matthew Henry's commentary has, has been one that's been used for centuries. It's always been in print and is very, very helpful to, you know, if you have a commentary, Matthew Henry. Um, and, um, you know, again, having a concordance or different study tools to help you compare scriptures. I think most Bibles have cross-references that allow you to look at other passages that might talk about that same thing, and maybe this scripture will help you understand this scripture better. But uh, asking uh, someone else who may know the answer to the question can be helpful too. Um, you know, uh, somebody that's you know been studying the Bible longer that you respect as as having some knowledge. Um, but again, commentaries are usually the places where most people go. If, if I'm studying and and I have a question of whether I'm understanding this passage correctly, I'll look at some commentators and see what what they have to say. Remembering that they also may be wrong. You know, they're just human beings. And so, um, you know, you, you look at maybe several different ones, and perhaps through that process, the Lord clarifies in your mind what that passage is actually saying. And if you believe that you've actually understood that passage and that's the way you see it, then that's the way you have to live unless or until the Lord gives you more light that would lead you in a different direction. Yeah. Okay. Any other um, questions or, or comments? 
Okay, time. Uh, I've gone about uh, 11 minutes or so over, so why don't we just close quickly with prayer, and then we'll get set up in the back and seek the Lord for the remainder of the time. Let's, uh, let's uh, have a word of prayer.